Gracious Lord, this is indeed your world, and you made it for us, and you made us. And we just marvel at that, and we should marvel at it. Help these readings today and our reflections to deepen our marvel at this marvelous world. In Jesus' name, amen. So thinking about the Bible, thinking about the Ten Commandments, thinking about this first commandment, have you ever wondered why God, why God makes such a fuss about worshiping other gods, other gods, lowercase g? Why would God, the Almighty Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, why would God worry about insignificant pagan gods, again, lowercase g? Why make that the first commandment? What's so bad about a little idol worship? You know, like the Israelites did in the wilderness when they were dancing around that golden calf. Now, yes, that golden calf, admittedly, it, it almost certainly represented a uh, a god, lowercase g, from Egypt, the place they had just fled after 400 years of slavery. And yes, they made that golden calf in a moment of real panic when Moses was up on the great Mount Sinai having one of his classic tete-a-tetes with God. He was delayed in coming back, and so they panicked. You know, God, uppercase g, the one the Israelites called Yahweh, the one who parted the Red Sea, delivering the Israelites from Egypt. But still, what's the real harm in worshiping, you know, an Egyptian, for example, an Egyptian pagan symbol? Big deal. Now, yes, some of those Israelites, they were begging to go back to Egypt, where at least they could they may not have had freedom, but at least they could get a decent meal. And in response, God, uppercase G God, gave them manna from heaven and water from a rock. But still, why all the fuss about these insignificant pagan gods? Well, first of all, maybe we can see here that the Lord was worried. That God was worried that the Israelites, worried about their willingness to continue on, to hang in there, out there in the wilderness. And maybe also God wanted to show the Israelites, or actually wanted them to show God confidence and trust and gratitude for God's having saved them just months before. But still, other than that, what could be the harm? What could be the harm in those other gods? Anyway, who could blame the Israelites for not wanting to put all their eggs in one basket? Arguably, worshiping other gods was a smart thing to do. Hedging their bet by, they were hedging their bet by schmoozing another god. In 1928, a farmer in what's now Syria, but in those days it was the ancient city of Ugarit, in the northern part of the land that we call Canaan, the Bible calls Canaan. Canaan, the, which is exactly where the wandering Israelites were headed. It was the land that was promised to them by God. So this farmer, is out plowing one day, and he runs into sort of, a, I guess it's a rock that's protruding. It seems like a rock at first that's protruding from the surface or from under the soil. And it turns out to be a fragment of a clay tablet. And they found lots of other fragments of those clay tablets, and brilliant archaeologists put them all together. And, and, and what they found was 150 different clay tablets and these clay tablets, they told story after story. 
many different stories about the ancient gods of Canaan, this land where they were headed, where the Israelites were headed, 234 different gods. Prior to this discovery of these tablets, most of what we knew back then about these Canaanite gods was from the Bible. It was the primary source of knowledge about these Canaanite gods, and, the, and in the Bible, God's many warnings about worshiping them. And so this discovery, it added a lot to what we know about those specific gods. Why? Why, you might ask, would the Lord, Yahweh, be so worried about these Canaanite gods? Of the many stories that were found, one is, it, it stands out in these, on these clay tablets. It's called the Baal cycle, B-A-A-L, which was the most, it was the God, lowercase g, that the Lord went after the most, criticized the most, and prophets criticized the most in Scripture, the Baal cycle. And it's a story of how Baal and some of the other Canaanite gods it's about, it captures their life together. And in this, specifically in the Baal cycle, it's, it tells how Baal, basically, who was the, basically the second most powerful of all these gods, and it's a story of how he gained power at the expense of the other gods. Baal, this menacing, frightening, God of storms and thunder. Weather mattered a huge amount if you were an agricultural society. Your life and death depended on it. The God also of both, so therefore the God of, of human soil and also, so fertility of the soil and also fertility, human fertility as well, having kids. He was often called Lord. Last week I mentioned that Lynn and I are watching this Netflix series called Ozark. And I made the observation that if you're looking for a show that kind of gives you a sense of what the world might be like, what life might be like without the Ten Commandments, this is a really good show for you to watch. Friends, the Baal cycle makes Ozark look like child's play. I won't recap the details of this long story. But suffice it to say that Baal and his heavenly consorts, they act like selfish fools. They're petty and defensive, and they're whiners who kill any other god, who then comes back to life, but they kill any other god and do unspeakable things to them, and also people, humans who get in their way. They demonstrate the worst of what humanity could ever offer. And most importantly, they could care less about human beings. Why? Why would God, Yahweh, the one who loved the Israelites enough to deliver them from Egypt, the one who promised them Canaan, the promised land, why would God be so worried about these absurd little Canaanite gods, these all too human petty gods? Let's add another reason. Because of the hopeless, the hopeless worldview that these other gods implied. A world, they, their stories implied a world where fate was left in the hands of these absurd characters who only care about themselves. If those, I'm thinking about the implications, if those are the rulers of the universe, pff, why wouldn't I live that way too? Caring only about myself and maybe also my family caring only about the things that are most important to me. You better bet God was worried about the allegiance of his people to the, in the land of 234 false gods and the warped direction 
that allegiance to those gods inevitably would lead. And something else. Did you ever notice how the gods of pagan cultures, including the Greek gods, who we tend to know much better, did you ever notice and did you ever wonder why these pagan gods almost always represent the things that we human beings care about the most? The things especially we worry about the most and long for the most. Fertility gods, sex gods, weather gods, agriculture gods, harvest gods, a sun god. Music gods, fire gods, grain gods, a god seemingly for everything we need, needed and wanted, they needed and wanted. And even gods, each city, town, nation had its own god that was extra special to them. Yes, of course, the Israelites' great lord creator of the universe, was worried about his people making gods in the image of their own worries and longings and thinking ridiculously that that would help. In the first commandment, the Israelites, in stark contrast, they are called to worship a God who was, yes, a demanding God, wanting loyalty and gratitude, but a God who actually did save them, and a God who wanted both to love and to be loved. A God who wanted a genuine two-way relationship with his people. And so, of course, the first thing God does is warn these ancient Israelites, no other gods but me, please, remember that. Yes, 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 we can see why Israel's God was so worried about these pagan gods back then. After all, these Israelites were so prone to idol worship, but not us. Does anyone... Ever question whether those things, those, th this first commandment, this worry about God's applies to us? Do you know anyone? Do you know anyone? Don't raise your hands. Do you know anyone who worships a golden calf in their house? I'm pretty sure not. Well, actually, on second thought, I do know someone who has been known to put his own worries and his own longings up on a pedestal, so much so that at times they overshadow God's voice in his life. Me. And my guess is plenty of us. You know the kinds of things I'm talking about, like I talked about it last Sunday, that broken squash racket or my rehearsal dinner. And also, <laughs> a trail of broken tennis rackets over my lifetime. Apparently, racket sports are a little too important to me. Not to mention my bank account, my family, my kids, my home, my health, my appearance, just to name a few. Friends, we can turn anything into a God. Our phones, our cars, our politics, our careers, and abstract things as well. Our pride, our egos, our angers. The great theologian Paul Tillich puts it this way, one's ultimate concerns become one's God's which is what Jesus is getting at this morning when he talks about our worries and our longings 
And this specifically, he's talking about food and clothing. He says, yes, those things are important. Of course they're important. But still, we need to seek God first. Seek the kingdom of God. And then all these things, of course, will be given to us as well. Jesus knows that when we put God first, it puts everything else in our lives into, pers into perspective. But of course, Jesus is not just talking about any God. He's talking about the one and only Lord who saved the Israelites and who gave us the Ten Commandments. The one who is revealed to us in Christ's own life, death, and resurrection. The one who loved us enough to sacrifice, to go up on a cross for us. The one who gives us a completely different worldview. A worldview centered on love and unselfishness worldview about caring about every single child of God, no matter what the difference from us. A worldview also, a worldview also full of hope, no matter how things look on the ground. A worldview that doesn't want us to panic in the wildernesses of our lives, which inevitably come, but instead to hang in there believing and trusting that God will deliver. Amen.